Here at the Westlock Gospel Chapel, as we have been experiencing pandemic challenges and leadership changes, we have set our course with five goals. First, hold steady. Second, seek God as we study and obey the scriptures. Third, let us keep the unity of the Spirit. Stir up love and participation in the body. And lastly, live in light of the soon return of Christ. With these goals in mind, we are embarking on a study through the Apostle Peter's first letter, which touches on many of these themes. So let's pray as we look at the Word of God this morning. Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you that you are with us, and that, Lord God, your Word is true and powerful, and that you will lead and guide us. So lead us now in this scripture study today. In Jesus' name, amen. Several Sundays back, one of our other elders, John Grant, shared a message giving us some background on Peter's life and times. Today, I would like to look at several general themes from Peter's letter and a perspective of how to read and apply these truths to our lives. Our first introduction to Peter, the disciple, is when Jesus chooses young men to follow him. He chose two pairs of brothers who were fishermen. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, he says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. These two brothers and others Jesus soon declared to them the manifesto of the kingdom of God in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in Matthew chapter 5. We know this scripture fairly well. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, etc. But when it comes down to the last verses of that, as those Beatitudes, Jesus makes some very challenging statements. He says in verse 10 of Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What would be the source of this persecution and the challenges that these followers of Jesus would experience? Well, I think Jesus clearly taught us about that and it really was found in the conflict between light and darkness. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Before that, he had talked with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he said this very clear statement, Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. In John chapter 7, Jesus said, The world hates me because I testify that its works are evil. So at the core of much argument and hatred of God is the unwillingness to let go of desires and addictions that are in contradiction to God and to the light that we live in in him. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, The world hated me before I hated you. And then he said to his disciples, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So Jesus called these disciples to follow him. Peter followed him. Peter was with Jesus probably every day as they were traveling, as Jesus was teaching and ministering. Jesus was taught the kingdom of God. He saw God, he saw Jesus work in miraculous ways, he saw the conflicts that were brewing, and we know that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, that uh, Peter failed Jesus, even in the temple courtyard, claiming he did not even know who Jesus was. And yet, following Jesus' resurrection, Peter was restored and was reassigned this mission of going and be, being a fisher of men. In that recommissioning, Peter dedicated the rest of his life, paying the price to take the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles. And now, nearing the end of his life in ministry, Peter pens a letter to the believers living in Asia Minor, the region of what would be now modern-day Turkey. He references the reality of suffering and persecution at least 17 times in this letter. It's a powerful guide to faith, courage, healthy relationships, and righteous conduct in the face of opposition. So I'd like to consider a few essential perspectives of this letter and how we can look at it for our lives today. So if you'll turn to me with me to 1 Peter chapter 1.
Peter begins encouraging the believers there in Asia Minor in verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. As I've read this epistle over a number of times now, I see some key themes that I think can be an encouragement to us. Here's the first one. God is in control. He has a plan. He knows how things will end even from the very beginning. Your life, your family, your well-being, even our church family, our country is not caught in some sort of out-of-control careen off the edge of a cliff. God has a plan, God is working out his plan in these days, and we get to experience it. Now we know from scriptures that God has given us glimpses of his plan and prophecies of things that will take place as we approach the return of the Lord Jesus. But here in 1 Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> we are introduced to this letter with the encouragement that we are heading toward a bright future and a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, and that God himself is the keeper of our inheritance. Nothing can decrease its value here on earth. And so God sees the big picture and is moving world history in a linear direction, ushering in his eternal dwelling for us in righteousness and in freedom in Christ. But then Peter goes on right to say in chapter 1, verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Several chapters later, chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter wrote, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. So here's the second point that I see of encouragement to us from this letter. Do not be surprised or confused when darkness raises its resistance against the light that is in you. This will be sure to happen as Jesus warned us in the verses that I read a few moments ago. However, then as Peter embraces these followers for this experience in their life and the things that would happen, we are assured that God is going to be with us. In 1 Peter 1.13, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There will be grace for every test and trial in our lives. We will experience great grace when Christ returns. But I believe even before then, along the way, as we learn more about the Lord, there is grace every day that comes from him if we'll but listen and learn. Then, in 1 Peter chapter 2, another theme that comes out here, he says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. We need to continue to cultivate a very healthy appetite in God's word. What is God saying to us? What is the Holy Spirit trying to communicate to us? And so I want to encourage you, Contemplative and diligent study of the scriptures will always be a source of God's grace for us. Again, as Peter writes of these challenges that are facing these believers in Asia Minor, he says to them that Jesus is our example that we should follow. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, and uh, it says in... Uh, it says there that Jesus is our example. So when he was reviled... We need to be strong in him. Um, yes. That uh, verse Peter chapter 2, verse 23. Who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. We are thankful that as we resolved not to retaliate to attacks, and instead we choose to love, we have Jesus as our example. We instead choose to forgive and bless, leaving the attacker and the threats in the hands of God. Now, we're not naive to what is going on, 
But instead, as Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, in the face of struggles and persecution, we're to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, Jesus went on to say clearly that we're not to fear people or their threats. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. You know, when we respond out of fear, we are giving the people we fear direct influence in our life and our actions. The only one we should fear is the Lord as we trust him and stand strong in his word. Another encouragement Peter gives in this letter is that prayer is our lifeline. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. In prayer, we can cultivate an alertness to the spiritual influences around us and listen closely for the Lord's advice, voice, discernment, and direction. And then, of course, we're to be reminded all the time that we are in a spiritual battle. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Prince of the power of the air knows that his time is short, so he is pulling out all the stops to destroy as many people in the deception and resulting hell. Now the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God for pulling down strongholds as we find in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. We are in a battle. And so, these themes and many others we'll look at as we study through the book of 1 Peter. But I want to encourage you today to take time to really be in this passage of Scripture. Our culture is becoming an increasingly hostile place. They're hostile to the righteousness of the kingdom of God. Our culture is rejecting absolutes in many forms and is intolerant of any truth that is upheld regardless of individual rights, choices, and trends. In our times, we're seeing more and more that there is a hatred toward God that is being fermenting, especially a hatred towards Jesus and towards Christendom and all the history and the, and the practices in past generations. At the heart of this, of course, we know there is an antichrist spirit in the world this prince of the power of the air. No one who loves the deeds of darkness is looking forward to meeting Christ, looking forward to his return. They're not looking forward to his judging and ruling the world in righteousness. And so as we live for Christ and as we speak of Christ, do not be surprised when people reject that or are ridiculing you. We will face also inner turmoil, though, when we experience that, because our own self-preservation kicks in, our own motivations. It's easy to become pessimistic. It's easy to become fearful. There are turbulent days ahead. That's why Peter encourages these believers here to trust the Lord. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's not wrong to admit that we're struggling. It's not, it's not bad to say to God, I'm really having a hard time with this. I need your help. For when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt us in due time. And the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after we have suffered a while, will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle us. And so we need to be strong in Christ and grow strong in him. 
In Luke chapter 21, verse 25 to 28, Jesus said, Now when these things begin to happen, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. And so Peter encouraged these followers in Asia Minor, in chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind, for he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So please, take this five-chapter letter, read it, meditate on it, let the variety of themes sink into your thoughts, into your motivations, and give you energy for a God-honoring life in these days to come. In the next weeks here, various leaders here will be taking portions and chewing into it, studying it, and sharing it in greater depth. But it's all with the intent of an encouragement to us to live in light of Christ's soon return, to not be afraid of the forces of darkness that want to rise up against Christ, but to stand strong in him and in the power of his might. May God so work in our lives as we seek first the kingdom of God and as we take up our cross daily that we will rejoice and be exceedingly glad in the fiery trial knowing that we share in Christ's sufferings and that we are joining with fellow believers around the world who are paying sometimes a very great price for their faithfulness to the Lord. May we be assured and optimistic in God's plan and the incorruptible inheritance reserved in heaven for every Christ follower who has heeded the Lord's call and who is desiring to come after him, denying themselves, taking up their cross, and following Christ. Let's pray together. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, may the reality of your love, of your grace, of your leading, and of your eternal plan and purpose be sufficient to carry us, encourage us, and empower us to live for you in these days. As we study and look through the epistle of First Peter, May God, its themes and truth guide us and lead us to follow you, to honor you, and put you first in every way. Lord, let us be faithful witnesses of you, letting the light of Christ shine forth through us. May our lives be lived in righteousness and godliness and holiness before you. May our, our mannerisms, our conversation, our presentation be honoring to you and no, in no way worthy of condemnation and yet, Lord God, fearlessly shared so that you can be glorified in our lives. We pray, Father, that there will be many people who will come to trust Christ even in these days in which we live, that we can open our hearts to the Lord and let him be Lord in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before I conclude, I'd like just to say to any of you who are listening to this message, I'd like to encourage you to turn your life over to the Lord if you've not done so. Jesus has come to reconcile us to the Father, to forgive us of our sin, to give us new life, to give us a hope and a future. The Lord is as near as our prayer. Turn to him and trust him. Let him give you fresh purpose, fresh motivation, fresh hope, not only in this life, but in eternity to come. The Lord loves you and is longing for you to turn to him and trust him with your life. If you have questions or thoughts, we welcome your interaction here at the Westlaw Gospel Chapel. Please give the church number a call. There's usually someone in the office weekday mornings. We can meet together, talk together, pray together. It's a joy to share with you today. May God guide you and lead you. In Jesus' name.